Toxicity being done, again, it's all about dose response. Um, this, is, this is important. The dose response relationship is based on observed data from ex uh, experimental animal, human, clinical studies, uh, or cell studies. Um, it's based on observed data. We're going to return to this because a lot of what we talk about when we're, uh, when we're discussing risk and uh, risk numbers are extrapolations from observed data. Knowing what is an actual data point versus what is an extrapolation is um, not a small concern. This is why dose response is so crucial and essential and fundamental. It establishes causality that the chemical has induced the observed effects. Why am I emphasizing that so much? Because in toxicology, in risk assessment, on all of the discussions that you hear about um, uh, environmental issues, it is so often correlations. You will hear an awful lot about correlations. People will get um, uh, very certain and whipped up about correlations. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows the difference between correlation and causality. Without a dose response curve, it is impossible, as far as I know, to determine causality. This is the mechanism to determine causality. Uh, even with dose response curves, you're, you're, uh, it's, it's challenging. But do, that's why dose response curves are so, uh, so important. It establishes the lowest dose uh, uh, that, uh, at which the effect occurs. Um, and this is going to be important when we discuss thresholds, and determines the rate uh, at which the, the, um, the injury builds up, uh, and the slope of the dose response curve is going to be very important. Okay, this, this graph is for responses to the same dose, okay? So we're gonna see dose response curves that are gonna have changing dose and responses. This is all to the same dose. So remembering that when we talk about dose response curves, we're talking about percentage response. This is recognizing that at a particular given dose that you're going to respond to it differently than I am, differently than, uh, than you are, that, uh, that there are going to be some people that are uh, particularly resistant, uh, some people that are going to be particularly susceptible, and so you work for the FDA, you work for the EPA. Who are you going to protect? You've got to set these levels. Are you going to protect these folks? Well, if you're OSHA, the Occupational um, Safety and Health Administration, well, then you're looking at healthy workers. That's what, historically, these levels have been, have been set for. But do you want to protect for the, the most um, uh, susceptible population? Do you want to protect for infants? Do you want to protect for compromised individuals who may already have pulmonary issues? Do you want uh, to protect for people who may already have chemical sensitivity? How do those policies play out? If you protect for, for the thin part of this curve by setting your, uh, your standards, what does that mean economically? What does that mean for commerce? What does that mean? So these are um, practically pragmatic, important questions. All right. This is your first dose response curve. This is the doses over time in milligrams. This is the response in percentages of people responding um, to whatever the uh, the effect is that you're measuring. You can um, tie this to any particular uh, type of response. You're going to have confidence limits around here. Uh, as you'll see, you'll have zero, uh, and we call that a threshold, okay? Uh, at what point does, uh, do you actually see an effect? Now, remember, 
Only these are the data points. You might think that to be a trivial, um, <laughs> a trivial point. But the, uh, again, the ability, uh, and the, uh, it's very common, to extrapolate beyond the data points. Because when we're running tests, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. When we run these types of tests, you need to, to have a data point. You need to see an effect. Sometimes you need to go to very high doses in order to see any effect. And so you'll have data points, and they need to extrapolate back in order to set a standard. OK, we'll talk more about that uh, over the next couple classes. So you'll see over, over time, uh, increased dose. You uh, will see a, uh, a curve. This is the classic, uh, classic S-curve for lethal dose. LD50 is perhaps the most common, uh, commonly used uh, data point, uh, uh, commonly used uh, standard by which people may measure things. The dose at which half of the population dies, okay? Um, whether it's, it's mice or uh, whatever kind of um, assay that you have. So here, at the 50% level, this is the dose that you um, uh, that you're going to see lethality. So when we look at LD50s for different substances, you have ethyl alcohol at uh, 10,000 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, as you go down, some of your innocuous substances, you go down to what is nicotine at, at, at one milligram per kilogram. Then you start getting into some of the most uh, toxic substances known. Uh, Dioxin, the most toxic um, synthetic substance, uh, botulinum toxin, uh, a couple orders of magnitude more, uh, more toxic. Just as, a, as an aside, Cassaret and Duels is uh, a reference that is largely considered the, the Bible of toxicology, if you ever want to refer to it. Um, so you can see, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So crossing better than 10 orders of magnitude. In, in terms of toxicity. All right. All right. So, comparing two different uh, shaped, the, the shape of the uh, of the dose response curve is going to be uh, important. Here, you'll see uh, different thresholds. The data points aren't outlined here, but two different thresholds uh, that that start before you start seeing an, uh, an effect. But the, sl the shape and slope are going to be uh, important. All right, so here's two different um, toxicants, toxicant A, toxicant B. Uh, this is the, the dose at which 10% uh, of the population is responding. Here is the, the, uh, the dose at which 15%, uh, 50 percent of the uh, uh, of the population is responding. And you'll see the difference between the two. So if we look at uh, the distribution, these become important because in many cases, you're going to want to know not only the toxic dose, but the effective dose. Imagine what we're talking about is a drug, a pharmaceutical, right? Um, if you have a, a dose response curve for the effective dose here, and you're measuring the, the ability for uh, something, for a drug to stop headaches, whatever it is, and the, and the toxic dose to, um, that is going to kill you instantly, right? Then you're going to need to know the, um, the, the slope and the, and the shape of these curves because you're going to want to have the, uh, the largest gap between those, those, two, uh, uh, those two curves. Why? So the effective dose for 50% of the population is going to still be at a place where there is no toxic effect, right? But if you say, hmm, all right, but if I want to get it to 90% of the population, 
then it's going to be toxic for, what, maybe 3% of the people? Does that sound familiar? When you're watching the commercials for, uh, for different drugs, and at the end of it, they're talking really fast and uh, listing off all of those people, a very small percentage of the population are going to, and I won't even list off some of the things that they say on TV, it's just terrible. Uh, so it's going to have all of these wonderful things. It's going to make you happier. It's going to make you taller. It's going to, uh, but a few people have experienced da-da-da-da-da. All of that comes from dose response curves. So take that and say, all right, well, that's good. I understand it for drugs. When you start thinking about other substances, all of the chemical substances that we use uh, every day in our, our society, it's the same types of decisions that, uh, that need to be made. Uh, so if we were to just uh, say, all right, well, we found a substance that, um, uh, that's used in, in baby bottles. And um, uh, knowing what the, what the effective dose, the performance versus the toxicity are, those types of cost-benefit questions are simply part of the decision-making process. In, um, and regulation. Questions? Okay. All right. So um, two dose response curves can have very, very different uh, shapes and, uh, and, and slopes. So you start seeing that here's, um, uh, again, the effective dose we, uh, uh, and the toxic dose. Here at a dose of 20 milligrams per kilogram, 20% of the people are going to be uh, uh, affected, but up here at 40 milligrams, uh, it's going to be effective for for 70 percent. But the difference between here is going to be toxic for almost no one. Here, it's going to be toxic for half of the people that that use it. Okay. Two terms you're going to need to know: um, no AL and low AL. No observed adverse effect level low observed adverse effect level. Crucial to understanding this, and, and something you need to remember, is that they are actual data points. Okay? That becomes important uh, because there can be wide gaps, orders of magnitude gaps, uh, and at different dose levels. Um, so sometimes they're in human clinical studies when it's things like pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's often experimental animal studies when it's on things like uh, 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 environmental issues. No AL. The highest data point at which there was not an uh, observed toxic or adverse effect, low AL. The lowest data point at which there was an observed adverse or toxic effect. Let's take a look. Okay, so dose response curve here. No effect, no response, actual data point. This is your no AL, no observed, low AL. Uh, the, the lowest point at which there was an observed toxic effect. Okay, why, is the, why are these two data points so, uh, so important? It's because these are the points that are used as the, called the jumping off points for setting standards by which you can be exposed to something. So that's called the reference dose. The reference dose is what you're going to encounter often when you start looking um, at what is considered acceptable exposure to, to something, OK? The reference dose means you say, well, I know that mercury is bad, but what's the reference dose? What, what is it that I can be exposed to? Uh, bisphenol A, lead, whatever else, the, the, uh, the phthalates, the, the, the brominated flame retardants. What is the reference dose is going to be the question. So the reference dose is what's considered an acceptable level to be exposed to. And the way the, uh, the reference dose is constructed is by taking uh, the no AL, the, the, the lowest level at which no observed effect was seen, uh, divided by uncertainty factors. Okay? So data point 
reference toes, not a data point. Okay? So real empirical number, derived number. Okay? Uh, why is that crucially important? Because uncertainty factors in these types of things can range, I put 10 to 1,000. Um, I've seen even higher uncertainty factors than that. So you'll say, well, we know that we saw a toxic effect at this, but we're going to put it 1,000 or 10,000 times lower for it to be acceptable because of these uncertainty factors. What are some of the uncertainty factors? Most of the time, you're not going to have testing done on humans. You'll have clinical trials for pharmaceuticals. For most everything else, you're not going to have that kind of data. So that could be a factor of 10, because you're going to extrapolate from animals to humans. Differences in human uh, susceptibility. So healthy worker to infant. Okay, If we're concerned about protecting infants, and we only have, even if we do have human data on healthy workers, we're going to put in another factor of 10. Adjustment factor for subchronic data sources, if, you go, if you're going from uh, subchronic um, to acute. Adjustment factor when the low AL is used. What if you don't have a no observed effect level? So at every dosage you gave, you saw an effect. When you uh, only have a low AL, you put in another factor of 10. Adjustment for when data incomplete, which is very, frequent, okay? Um, because you're never going to have all of the data, all of the tests. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude. All right, so this is, uh, this is what we're dealing with with some of the um, toxicological challenges. Um, um, not only making policy, setting standards, but these are the fundamental handles that we're going to use when we start thinking about, OK, that's what makes to something toxic. How are we going to make something non-toxic? How are we going to practice green chemistry? How are we going to design the next generation of molecules? All of these are the factors that we're going to consider.